All right, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4 today. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Acts chapter 4. This is a, uh, it's an incredible thing to teach through the book of Acts. It's like, I mean, I know I did it uh, 11 years ago here at Anthem. We taught through Acts and teaching through it again. It just is, I, lo- I love it. I love this book. And I know I'll say this a lot. You'll probably get tired of me saying it by the end of our time together uh, going through Acts. But one of the reasons that I love this book so much is it just represents us It's the finished work of Jesus. It's the poured out presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the apostles teaching what will become the scriptures that we have. It's the devotion to these elements, the church itself. This is us. This is our story that we are reading through, studying, understanding, and learning how to live out in our day-to-day life. And so when we read these things... It's not this, oh, that was then, that was the way they used to do it, that was back when God used to move, that was how things used to be when the Holy Spirit was active, and now the Holy Spirit's just kind of taking a a nap. Like, that's not the story that we're in. We are in the thick of what we're reading in the book of Acts. So as we read this, there will be some key things that we're going to pull out. I just want you to hear it through that lens of this is our story. So starting in verse 5, we'll go through verse 22. This is Acts chapter 4. It says this. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were with, uh, sorry, all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Last week, we talked about a healing that Peter and John did. Uh, a man lame from birth had jumped up and started walking and leaping and praising God. So they're being examined for this miracle. Verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, I wonder what those guys look like. You look uneducated and common. Those are compliments, right? Uh, They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this amazing text. I I pray that you would uh, fill us with your spirit as hearers of your word. Lord, to receive, to know, to be empowered and encouraged, would you shape us today? Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. All right, so starting things off, we have Peter filled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter and John were arrested. They had been walking to the temple for their regular prayers. They see a man. The man sees them. He cries out for alms. He's a, a man lame from birth, and he's begging. He cries out for alms, and they say, silver and gold we do not have, but what we have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And they reach out their hand, and they grab him and pull him up, and the man leaps up and starts running and jumping and leaping and praising God. 
like from not walking for his entire life to having fully functioning legs, the guy just, he's pumped. He's excited. He is so thrilled with what's gone on. So they all start walking into the temple, and this whole crowd starts running after them. They want to be a part of the energy of what just happened. They're, they're running after the crowd, and they're curious, and they're perplexed, and they're astonished, and they just want to know more. So this whole crowd runs in, and Peter and John look at that crowd, and they start preaching the gospel to that crowd. They preach about Jesus, who that crowd had shouted, crucify him just a few weeks before, and hear the the power, the miracles that Jesus had done, now his disciples are in fact doing as well. It's a a crazy moment. And then the Jewish leaders come in, and they see what's happening. They're at the temple, and Peter and John are preaching about Jesus, who this whole crew just crucified a few weeks before. And so to tamp things down, they arrest Peter and John to give it a night to breathe. So they take Peter and John and put them in jail, and then they bring Peter and John out the next day. And the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem. So I want you to imagine like the seating like a, like a semicircle, and Peter and John are placed sort of at the center of this semicircle of the leaders. And Luke makes a point to mention who's there. Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, and then a couple other guys named John and Alexander that we don't know that much about. But Annas and Caiaphas, according to John 18, are the two that were judging Jesus and determining that he was going to be the one that should die. John 18 tells us that Caiaphas is the one that says, hey, it's better if one man dies. He's looking at the situation and saying, we need to put an end to Jesus. Caiaphas himself was the one that said, we need to put an end to Jesus. And here he has Peter and John standing before him in this very moment. And when they set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Uh, is anybody in here a lawyer? Raise your hand if you're a lawyer. Just cause, out of curiosity. Anybody a lawyer? We don't have a single lawyer. We got to save some lawyers, guys. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, where's Brock? Come on. All right. He ruined my moment. Yeah, all right. No lawyers in the room. Okay. Well... I'm not a lawyer, but I've seen a lot of movies and read a lot of John Grisham books. And so what I know about the law is this. You never ask a question that you don't already know the answer to. And these guys ask the question, by what power or by what name did you do this? And you can just imagine Peter and John in this moment like, you want us to answer that? Like, Is this real? They're standing in front of the the Sanhedrin, the rulers of Jerusalem, and they're being asked a direct question, by what power or by what name did you do this? And the text tells us, Peter, filled by the Holy Spirit, said to them, all right, guys, if we're being examined for a good deed, let us tell you. Here's our answer. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel That by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This is an interesting moment. Peter and John are like, all right, if we're being asked in this official setting, we want the gospel on record. Imagine court documents and people writing things down. This is one of those kind of moments. And they get asked an official question and they give an official answer One of the commentators that I was reading on this said that the Sanhedrin could no longer function in ignorance after this. They have been given a direct answer to the question that they asked. By what power or by whose name have you healed this man? They say it was by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that one that you crucified a couple weeks ago. By his name, this man is standing fully well. Now, they had the man there. So they arrested Peter and John. We don't actually know if they arrested the crippled man as well. That might not have gone over with the crowd. What was his crime? Being healed. And so either he was in jail overnight or he came back the next day and was there and was a part of the trial as evidence. But he was standing with them and they're looking at him and saying, that was done in the name of Jesus. Now, Peter, instead of just answering the question, kind of 
pushes his uh, luck just a little bit. And he says this in verse 11. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So the first thing that happens here is Peter draws, I mean, we're like lifetime. He didn't have a chance to really prep for this sermon. This is him coming out of jail, getting asked a question and him responding to it. And he quotes Psalm 118 back to the Sanhedrin. And these guys would have known this text. They would have memorized this text. They would have had some idea even of the interpretation of this text. And in this moment, Peter applies the text to them and says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. Now, there's other places where, like in 1 Peter 2, where he'll quote this passage, and he'll talk about Jesus being the stone that the builders rejected. Well, here he's got a chance to speak to the builders. He's talking to the specific people that rejected Jesus as the stone. And he's applying this prophetic word directly to them. This Jesus is the stone that the builders, you, Psalm 118, was talking about you, Annas, and you, Caiaphas. You rejected Jesus, and now he has become the cornerstone. He is the centerpiece of God's redemptive work. He is what all else will be built upon, and you rejected him. Then Peter goes on just a little bit further. It says there's salvation in no one else. Now, here's an interesting thing about the gospel. Uh, my friend DJ leads a church in Downey, Imago Day, and he, he preaches it this way. He says, the gospel is radically inclusive, which a lot of us like that word, inclusive. We want an inclusive gospel. He says, at the same time, it is radically exclusive. The gospel is simultaneously radically inclusive and radically exclusive. And let's talk about that for just a minute. It's inclusive in the sense that Jesus is invitational. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is any of you thirsty? Let him come to me and drink. And from his heart will flow rivers of living water. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. It is radically inclusive. The message of the gospel is come, come, come. But it is radically exclusive. And that the gospel is explicit that there is no other way to life but through Jesus Christ. As much as we would like to think it, maybe some other people have some truth that they've got kind of grabbed a hold of and they've found a way to God. Maybe there is the the kind of divine equation that if people just are decent people and do enough good stuff that, that when all's said and done, God will kind of just allow them into eternity. Maybe there's a way. Maybe the Bible tells us a way, but it doesn't tell us the way. But the problem with that is either the Bible is true and it is God's word, or we should throw it away. It's one or the other. This isn't a part of a compilation of true religions that are out there that people can pick from and find their way to God. We know that because the Bible is so exclusive and says it's only Jesus. There was a problem in the world that needed to be solved, and God created a solution to that problem in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and it's it. It's the only way. And we don't say that to people to be arrogant to say we have found the way and everybody else has got it wrong. It's not a posture of arrogance. It's a posture of reality. If our sin is going to be dealt with, if there's going to be forgiveness and life with God, if an unholy people can stand in the presence of a holy God, it's going to come through the finished work of Jesus. And Peter makes that abundantly clear by saying there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is what God gave us. 
And we have the opportunity either to respond to that or to reject that, but this is what God has given us as a way to be saved. So we hold on to that and we know that. This is Peter, filled by the Spirit, preaching the gospel to these people. Now, let's skip down just a, a little bit. Let's talk about, oh, what's next? We cannot speak of what we have seen and heard. So as we go down, and by the way, I'm going to circle back to a couple of things when we wrap. But you see this response, and they talk about it. The guys go away, and they try and figure out what to do in this situation. So they send Peter and John away. And they say, what shall we do? This is verse 16. For a notable sign has been performed, and it's evident to everybody. So the Jewish leaders are aware that there's pressure. Everybody saw this. We all know what happened. We're not going to come out and say it didn't happen. We have to come out and say we know it happened. And we have to give some reason why it happened. But they still don't want to give credit to Jesus. They don't want to affirm that they just crucified the Messiah, the one that they themselves have been waiting for their entire lives, that all of Jewish history has been building towards. They don't want to open up and say, we ended that. Even if it was God's will and purpose, they're still nervous about acknowledging that they were at the helm. And so they call Peter and John back in. They've got a great idea. This is our idea. We'll bring them in. We'll just tell them not to talk about Jesus anymore. What if, what if uh, we just let them go with just a warning? Just, shh. Peter and John answered them, and they say this, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. I just, I love this. They've got the Sanhedrin. So, I don't know, maybe 24 people sitting in a semicircle saying, here's what we think. We think you should go away from here and just don't talk about Jesus anymore. And Peter and John are standing there and saying, okay, we need your discernment here for a moment. Should we listen to God or you guys? Because you're saying different things. Jesus told us to go and make disciples. He told us to go be his witnesses. Jesus told us to do something different than what you're telling us to do. And Jesus is God. So we have to discern right now, do we listen to God or do we listen to you? And then they go on and say, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And this, I just want to take a few minutes and talk to you about, is the Christian life. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And one of the things that can tend to happen when we uh, think about the idea of evangelism. And honestly, in a room like this, I'm guessing we're in the 80% followers of Jesus. Most of us have given our lives to Jesus. Some of us are searching and trying to figure out if this is what we, be, what we believe. But the ones of us that have already given our lives to Jesus are tasked with a specific assignment to go make disciples of all nations. It's not for other people. It's not for other Christians. It's not for people with a different gift mix or a different personality. It's not for trained seminarians. It's not for missionaries that have gone through years of training and you are somehow exempt. This is the call on every believer for all time. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go. Teach people to obey Jesus. And baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is the job of the church, of the people of God. Go. And most of us exempt ourselves from that. And something that's happened in the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years is we've gone down this road of trying to be strategic with our evangelism. Like, okay, well, we'll build relationship first. We'll build trust first. And then, I don't know, 15 20, 25 years later, we kind of let people know that we're Christians and we go to church and invite them to come with us. Sometimes we can get so nervous about telling people our spiritual life that we hold on to this unbelievably powerful and beautiful truth and we don't release it into the lives of people when the thing that God has asked us to do is to release this beautiful life into the lives of the people that we love and the people that we hate, our friends and our neighbors and our enemies are to get the goodness of God. It's for us to take and receive and then to give. It is not for us to hold on to. 
Peter and John summarize in a phrase what at some point we just we do need to train ourselves into. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Now, a little bit about the what we have seen and heard. Uh, I grew up in the church. Uh, literally, my parents planted a church three days before I was born, so I grew up in the church. Everything about my life was church. Uh, I grew up in Sunday school. I did a wanna, memorized tons of scripture, sword drills, the whole nine yards. If you don't know what any of those things are, I apologize. That's just church life as a kid in the 80s, and that was uh, my life. That was Kristen's life. This is what we grew up in. Anybody else grow up in what I just described? All right. Well, welcome to the party, pals. Um, <laughs> And what can kind of happen in that upbringing is we can start to minimize the idea of our testimony. We get a little bit nervous, like it just, there was no power encounter. There was no radical transformation. I wasn't, uh, you know, a heroin addict on the streets, and then Jesus came into my life, and now I'm walking with Jesus and preaching the gospel, and, and I get to testify to the power of transformation from the gutter to this glorified moment of serving Jesus, and we can kind of end up just being like, I was just a church kid that said yes, and I got baptized, and now I'm just here. And so it feels like there's no, there's no power in our story, so we hold off on our story, and that idea of what we have seen and heard we're just like, I haven't really seen anything. I haven't really heard anything. When you, when you really look at it, I don't, I don't know the power of God all that well. And so our testimony ends up not being something that we're oftentimes really willing to share or speak about because it just, what do I tell people? Yeah, I was a decent kid, and then Jesus made me a better kid. I think some of the reason that we preach the way that we do, going through Romans, is trying to help you understand what is more true than the story that I just described. And that's that each of us, from the day that we were born, were enemies of God. We were born into sin. We were born into a curse. We were born into needing to be rescued by the living God. And it was God's grace that for many of us, we were born into a situation where we got to hear the news of that rescue, but it is no less dramatic that you were saved from hell than somebody whose life represented just the hardest elements of this world. Now, those transformation stories are beautiful and worthy of praising God for. But I guess what I'm trying to say to you, church kid, is so is yours. Your story of rescue is supernatural. God came into your life, a life that was destined for destruction, that was going to be eternally judged for your sin, and God rescued you out of darkness and brought you into this marvelous light. And that story is a story of power. Then there's the what we've seen and heard. One of the reasons that we love going to the nations, that we love bringing friends like Tom in, that we love just being a part of things bigger than ourselves is sometimes our stories can feel a little neutered when they just start to live within the walls of our church. We can maybe start to feel like nothing's happening. Now, something is happening at this church. Like, different than the previous years of leading this church, something is happening at this church. It's beautiful, it's powerful. You can sit here like last week, Barrett was talking to us, just like, this, this is different. And there is, there's something happening here. It's, it's beautiful. But sometimes when we can just go through life as a local church, we can just start to feel like the stories are familiar and things aren't really happening and nothing much is going on and there's not a lot taking shape. But the reality of the church is God is on the move in a powerful way. He's shaking things loose. He is healing. He's working with power. He's breaking ground in new nations. We're starting to hear story after story after story of where people are breaking open the hardest ground in the world to see the gospel flourish. We're seeing incredible work happening in the far reaches of not only the world, but also our nation. 
also our community, also our church. And it helps us to lift our eyes and see that God is at work. So one of our challenges constantly is to put yourself in a place where you are seeing and hearing the powerful work of God. So that there's none of this anymore, like my story's not that big of a deal and I don't really see anything or hear anything that God's doing. We want you to experience the fullness of God's power so that you cannot but speak of what you have seen and heard and everybody that you come into contact with. You cannot but tell them about the bigness and the goodness of Jesus because he's doing incredible things to transform this world all the time. We just need to train ourselves to see it and talk about it. So my challenge to you is do not be the one that neuters God, that robs him of his power and his story by minimizing your own or by narrowing the scope of your view to just a a small world that doesn't have any of the power of God at work in it. Let your eyes be lifted to see God at work because it is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Last thing that we'll talk about, I want to go back up to something that I skipped over. This is verse 13. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. So a little bit about Peter and John. Uh, If you know the story of the disciples, Peter and John were fishermen. Uh, Most likely when Jesus called them into ministry, they were mid to older teenagers, so probably in their uh, 16, 17, 18 year olds. So maybe by the time they're standing in front of the Sanhedrin, uh, they're 20 year old kids, give or take. 20 year old young men. Now, Peter's already married. That's a lot of life happened earlier in Jewish culture. So things have already started to take shape for them. Uh, They have lives and they are adults, even at 20 years old. But they're young. There's a path that you would go down if you're a a Jewish kid. You would go to Hebrew school. You would learn the Torah. And then at the end of your Hebrew school, uh, they would determine if you've got the goods to go forward into the next stage of school, or you would uh, be asked very kindly to be done with your education and to go work in your family business. And if you uh, left to go work in your family business, your education stopped at that point. So all the kids got Hebrew school, but not all the kids got the next level and the next level and the next level. And ultimately, the pinnacle was rabbinical school where they would uh, go and they would actually learn from one of the rabbis. We learned that Paul was an apprentice to Gamaliel. That's the highest of education that they had to offer in the Jewish system. So we have Peter and John that did not make it through the first round of, or maybe they made it through the first round, but they got to the end of the first round of their schooling. And then we have Paul, who made it to the farthest reaches and even became a Pharisee himself, the most educated in Jewish life. So just know that we have the spectrum in the Christian world. So these Sanhedrin folks, they would have been the ones that made it all the way and then became the master rabbis and then probably even started having students themselves. And now they are the Sanhedrin. They're the rulers of the Jewish court. And they're looking at Peter and John And they're saying, okay, clearly, these are uneducated common men. But Peter's grabbing Psalm 118, and he's like, you, you are the builders that rejected the stone. They're they're speaking with such authority. And the, the leaders are looking at this, and they're like, okay, clearly, these are uneducated common men. But they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Here's the question that I want to ask. Was this the first moment that they recognized that these guys had been with Jesus? Or is there something else going on here? When you look at the story of Peter and John, there's an element of their lives that are forever marked by the fact that they walked with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. They moved in, out, and around Jerusalem, Israel, Galilee for three years with Jesus. They ate with him. They crashed together in Peter's house. Been to all Peter's mom's house. Peter lives at his mom's house. They've been to all kinds of places together. They've been with Jesus. One of our tendencies can be to say, well, those guys were with Jesus. They were with Jesus. They saw things we didn't see. They had access to things we didn't have access to. Peter got to climb out of the boat and walk on water. They were with Jesus. 
But Jesus tried to prepare us for his absence by saying a couple of things that I think are pretty important. Matthew 28, 20 says this. Jesus says, I will be with you to the very end of the age. Is he talking to Peter and John? Absolutely. Is he talking to you and me? Absolutely. In John 15, 4, Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. Jesus' purpose and intention for life with you and life with me is togetherness, withness, that we would be walking together in life, abiding in him and him in us, a life together. We know this because in John 17, Jesus preaches this, I do not ask for these only. Who are the these only? Those are his disciples that are there at that exact moment. That would be the 12 minus Judas. That's the crew that's with him at that exact moment. And he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through the word that they will teach. That's us. Jesus in John 17 is praying for us. And what does he pray? This is incredible. He says that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So he's, he's comparing the union of the Father and the Son, and he's saying to the next generation of believers, I want them to experience the union that you and I are experiencing. So this is Jesus praying for us that we would experience this union with him. And he says this. He says that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, again, that's us, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me. Why is this important? The qualifications for evangelism have nothing to do with education or sophistication. Peter and John were uneducated common men. The qualifications for you to share the word of God is not that you know enough information or that you have all the right ways to say it, which those are the two main reasons that we most often do not share the gospel is I don't know enough or I don't know how to say it. I'll probably get myself into more trouble. Anybody ever fold clothes at home and you're like, I'm just doing such a bad job. I probably shouldn't even do this at all. Here you go, babe. Or is that just our marriage? Sorry. Sorry. Sometimes when it comes to the the gospel, we say it would be better for somebody else to preach it because they can say it better than I can. And what we have here is, no, that's not the qualification for evangelism. The qualification for evangelism is have you been with Jesus? Have you been with Jesus? And you might think they were with Jesus. And Jesus is telling you, I am am with you. And this is a critical moment for you to believe something. How is Jesus with us? Is it, was that a pep talk? Like, hey, go get them, guys. I got your back. Was Jesus just sending us out into the world with this holy high five saying, you got it, go get it? Or was Jesus telling us what he actually told us, that it is better for him to go because his presence will come and will be in us and with us. And everywhere we go, Jesus goes with us. His presence goes with us into every moment of every day. Jesus is with you. When you are about to open your mouth to preach the gospel to anybody, Jesus is with you. So the picture of being with Jesus is the element of John chapter 15, where Jesus does tell us, Abide in me and I in you. There's a conditional element to it. For us as believers, his presence is always there with us. But there's an element, an invitation to cultivate that witness in John 15, where Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. There's his invitation for us to rest in him, to do life in him and with him, to walk daily in relationship with him, 
to grow in understanding that he's there with us, to learn how to talk to him, to have this communion with him where we're just growing in our togetherness by his spirit. We're going to have a baptism this morning, and that picture of baptism is designed to show us this picture of union, that we're united with Jesus in his death, and we're united with Jesus in his resurrection, and that's the call of us, is to live our lives in union with Jesus. And when we do that, Jesus makes his witness known. Meaning, people start to see when you've been with Jesus. I just want to ask a question, and you can raise your hand if if you want, because I think it'd be helpful for people to see. Have you ever been with somebody that you see on them like, oh, that person's been with Jesus? Raise your hand if you've been with somebody like that. Okay, I've been with people like that. It's like it just... Jesus is just pouring out of them. The fruit of the Spirit is there. There's, there's love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control that just kind of flows out of them. The Word of God is on their lips. The anointing of the Spirit of God is with them. You're just with somebody, and their presence is encouraging. Just being around them is a help to your faith. That witness is what is going to break through into a hard world. You being with Jesus and then being in the world, you are going to see the light of Jesus shine through you into the darkest places of a hurting world. This is why we call on the body of Christ to live life with Jesus. Walk by the Spirit. Learn how to saturate yourself in his word because it does matter. It matters for eternity, for people to know Jesus. It matters for us to walk with him. I'm going to pray for us. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the joy of witness of what it means for us to do life with you. Lord, I pray that that would build in us a boldness and a readiness to preach your name. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.